Hey everybody, it's Kat with Tastemakers and I am here with none other than Sarah Marshall, the brain power behind uh, Marshall's Hot Sauce in Portland, Oregon. And we got to know her a little bit in our second season and I've had a chance to catch up with her from time to time over the past year or so. And today I'm super excited because essentially we are going to sit together and have a drink for this happy hour because your stock and trade, Sarah, is making hot sauces and wonderful like seasoning powder, all this kind of stuff. But you actually have taken your your talent for you know mixing flavors and you've partnered up with a wine company. Yeah, I did. So we have made this wine for a couple of years. And it actually just started out as we were going to make a drink with our friends at Union Wine for a party. And then we just liked it so much that they wanted to bottle it. And so now every year we go out to the winery and make it. That's so fun. And what I think is interesting is you see a lot of, you know, beers that are infused with different flavors, obviously a lot of spirits. You don't see it very often in wine. So how, how do you guys work on that? Do you taste the wine first and then say, oh, I think this could use a little bit of this, that, how does, how does that collaboration work? I think that probably if you're a wine purist, maybe this would be like some kind of blasphemy or something, but, but I think that, um, you know, Union Wine has a, quite a few wines labeled under their brand. So they have the King's Bridge line and the Alchemy line, and they make really wonderful wines. And their whole thing is that they want to make affordable wines from Oregon. And so it just made sense for us to partner together because we're buddies for one, and we were doing a lot of shows together and holiday parties and things like that. And we were always at the same restaurant things. And we were just like in the same, you know, circle and group of friends. And so because all of our sauces kind of tell the story of Oregon, we decided that we were going to just like combine our flavors and do it. So we took our, one of our seasonal sauces, which is our cranberry red jalapeno sauce, and we didn't put the sauce in the wine because that probably wouldn't be very good, but we just <laughs> used a lot of the um, flavors. So our cranberry red jalapeno sauce uses, you know, a lot of cranberries grow here in Oregon and in Washington. We're kind of known for that for our cranberry bob. So we use local cranberries and then we infuse the sauce with all of these warming spices like um, you know, star anise is one of them. We use this beautiful cinnamon. And so we just took the flavors from the sauce and put them into their wine. And so it was really just expanding the story of Oregon and all the great things that come from here. I love it. And, you know, so much of what I do in telling the story of people like you, these incredible makers, is that you know, where I find a lot of the magic really happens is when two great makers get together and create a collaboration, whatever, whatever that might be. It could be a dish in a restaurant, it could be a beer, it could be a wine, it could be anything, but having like these two really awesome culinary brains kind of coming together and creating something totally new, I think that is just a lot of fun. And the fact that you're, you're really focused on what is coming from Oregon. I mean, it, it's a natural extension of what you're passionate about. Yeah, and that's part of my favorite thing to do. You know, when I come up with soft flavors or recipes or when I'm cooking, you know, I'm really just walking the market and kind of trying to tell the story of what's happening. So sometimes people are like, you know, where do you come up with these flavors? And really, it's just about what's happening at the market at that time. I mean, one of our most popular sauces is our Serrano ginger lemongrass sauce. And that really just came about because ginger and uh, local ginger and local lemongrass and serrano peppers are all in season at the same time. So it wasn't like exactly just me being like, I'm going to put these things together. It's just kind of what's going on in, in the market. And then I feel like this wine is the same thing. It's what's going on in the state, you know, because the stuff is coming from all over the state. The um, cranberries, we do a cold pressed cranberry juice with local cranberries. And so we infuse the flavors into the cranberry juice and then add it to the wine and then we bottle it. I think we should taste now. Yeah, let's I'm do so it. Curious. I've got to taste this. <laughs> yeah, and it's kind of fun because it has a little, um, you know, cap on it and I, you can drink it in just a regular wine glass, which I think is what you're going to do. My husband really likes to drink it over ice, like a cocktail. Oh, sure. And so 
I will always like garnish it with little cranberries as a garnish, just frozen cranberries. And then I like to drink it warm, like by the fire. Because usually, um, you know, this sauce, we make it right before harvest season. So then it's like, gets kind of cold by the time it comes to market. But I like to serve it hot. Cheers to you. Cheers. Okay. <laughs> Mm. Oh wow, that's really good. It's yeah. like um, it's like a really sophisticated take on mulled wine. Yeah, that was kind of the idea. So we made it for a holiday party at first, but we found that you know it's great all year round. <laughs> but it has all these nice warming spices with the cinnamon, the clove, the star anise, because those flavors are in the hot sauce. And then the cranberry juice gives it this nice tart, tangy aspect. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we use just dried chili flakes, the Calabrian chili flakes. And so it gives it just a little bit of spice in the end, but it's not like overwhelmingly spicy. No, that's really lovely. So often, like I've had other flavored wines before, and a lot of times they'll kind of tend towards sweet because I think that a lot of people who infuse flavor into wine assume that people who reach toward a flavor wine, flavored wine are looking for something that's more sugary, candy-like, that kind of a thing. And this is not that at all. There's, you know, the, the wine has a really nice backbone to it. What is the base wine? Is it a Pinot? It's a Pinot. So I think that's really the big difference. So this is the um, Underwood Pinot, which is one of the brands under Union. But in, their, in this one, we use the King's Ridge Pinot. So all the grapes, you know, are from Oregon and it's just a really nice wine to start with. And I think that's why we don't, you know, we don't have to make it sweet. It's not a wine cooler, you know, it's just a really nice infused wine beverage. And it's kind of, you know, I think the cranberry is really the key because it gives it this tartness with all those warming spice flavors. That's really fun. Yeah, it's, it's very fun. So have you expanded kind of your line of infused wines with with um, Kings Ridge beyond this? No, we just do this one. And the, the reason I love this project is that, you know, like I said, we're just going to make it for a party. We were all coming out and we're going to for a holiday event and we were doing together. And then we decided that we were going to do it every year. So Dirk and I go out to the winery. And, you know, in, in the scheme of things, this winery is a small Oregon winery, even though they distribute everywhere. But we go out there with their winemaker and just Dirk and I, we make it at the winery. And so we're putting the spices into the barrels and we're infusing it. And then they put it into these big tanks and then they bottle it. So we don't actually have anything to do with the wine making because I thought I don't even know how to make wine. <laughs> but we just have to do with the wine infusing. We do that piece of it. <laughs> so were they, were they open to your ideas? Did they ask you just to kind of come, like, I know that you said that it kind of, it was based on just knowing these folks and being friends with them. And, and also you have this wonderful kind of seasonal sauce, but did they just trust you? I mean, were there various batches that you guys came up with? Like, what was that like? Yeah, so, you know, because there's always risk involved when you're doing a big run, you know, so our first run, you know, we made the one that was for the party, it was great, everybody liked it, but then they had the winemaker, because, you know, winemakers are very experienced, they've done it a lot, I had never made wine, and I just made it, you know, in one big jug and brought it over, and I had my recipe, like, on a piece of scratch paper, and so then we had to actually go into the wine lab and do all these different things with the different blends, and we did all of these taste tests, and he did some versions, and I did some versions, and in the end, the one that they chose was the original one, after we had everybody taste it. And then we just had to figure out how to do it on a bigger scale because <laughs> it's much different than, you know, when I was doing it, I'm putting like two cinnamon sticks in the <laughs> jug of wine. And this was like, you know, we're dumping these big barrels of cinnamon sticks into the heater. So it was a much different process, but that's what makes it super fun. You know, I love learning new things from people. I learned a lot about what it's like to make different wine blends and taste different wines. And then just go out there to their facility, which is really cool. I'm sure you've visited a lot of wineries. It's a lot different to be there in person. It's just like this very wonderful experience to be there. And so it was really cool to be part of that. And now I get to do it every year. I think this is our, our fifth year of making it together. Yeah. So 
does it make you maybe want to get into like winemaking or experimenting? Because you already are very into fermentation and preservation, yeah. all that kind of stuff. I mean, does it does it spark any interest in you? I think, I mean, everything I do sparks interest in me and I always want to do new projects and I'm always interested in trying new things. I think for now, just doing it once a year is plenty. <laughs> I also have to do all my other things, but I love it. I mean, I love being part of it. I love working with other local people. I mean, that's why I started this business. I wanted to work with people that were in my community and build these friendships and be able to tell other people's stories along with mine. It's just part of my passion and why I keep doing it. You know, this is actually my 10 year anniversary of being a sauce maker right now. <laughs> Congratulations, Sarah. I did not realize yeah. it's been 10 years for you. It's been 10 years. And that's, you know, I did social work before, and that's how long I did social work for. So this is like, I'm at the equal point. So I feel like this is my, this is my journey. You know, I've been on it for quite some time. And I think that it's never boring for me because I get to do these really fun things with other people. Well, but you create that for yourself. You seek that out. I mean, that really is the heart of what you're doing. I mean, you aren't just ordering, you know, peppers and ginger and whatever from some large distribution company. You, like you said, you are specifically walking the market in Portland and getting to know the farmers and finding out, you know, what they might have an overrun of or, you know, what's coming, you know, into, you know, what's fruiting or what's, you know, coming into season. And, you know, because of that, what you have is, you know, it's unique to Portland, but it's also unique to you because it's about your experience and where you have found your relationships. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, because it's been, you know, it's changed a lot too. So, you know, some, a lot of the farmers I started sourcing from in the beginning that were farmers at the farmer's market, they have now retired. So now I have these new relationships with new farmers. And I love that opportunity because I can support their farms when they're just starting out. And we have this big movement of female farmers in Oregon that are getting land and starting small scale farms and starting them closer to the city. And so I can have these friendships with them too that I couldn't always have with the farmers that are a little bit further away. And so it's really nice to have that, especially you know during this time where I think it's so important to bond together when we can. And the space that I have for that right now is the farmer's market. And so it's really lovely to be there and have that community because it's so much less isolating during these times, you know. You know, it's interesting. I mean, it's been about a year, almost exactly a year since all of this insanity started. And it was right at the beginning of farmer's market season when this hit. And there was a lot of word of the year pivoting or whatever that the farmers markets did in order to be able to you know keep their doors open keep feeding people keep offering farmers the opportunity to sell you know where do you see everything now as we're kind of entering into a new market season um a year into this i mean have you seen that people have kind of reached an equilibrium are they are they kind of figuring things out because I feel like I've seen a lot of farmers pivot to like CSA models as a way to sell directly. I think, um, you know, so last year at this time, right before the shutdown, that was actually the last time I saw you in person, we were both at the Intense Conference at the mm -hmm. Farmers Market Pro Conference as speakers. And I just um, did the conference again this year, but virtually. And last year when I was there, I was there to tell people to interact with the farmer's market, to have this face-to-face -face conversation, to bring your friends and family. And then like weeks later, everything was shut down, including, you know, our markets. They, they were making it just essential. So it was just for farmers. So I wasn't there as a vendor, but I went and volunteered at the market. Um, but then I was able to come back and did, and I'm back at the markets again now. And I feel like right now, it's really good. Um, I think that people have figured out how to do it safely. I think they've figured out they're less stressed, I think, in the very beginning, just because people didn't know. And some people were wearing masks and some people weren't. And everybody was afraid to talk or to get close to anybody. You know, all this stuff, It was there was just a lot of tension in the air. And I feel like that has changed because we've figured out how to be in an open outdoor space safely. So that feels good to have that now. And um, and I think it'll just keep getting better as people get vaccined and 
all of that. And I think farmers did pivot, some of them to do CSAs, but I think here, at least, they still kept coming to the farmer's market. Uh, the people that kind of held off were people like me, food artisans, but we were really supported in this area by our local grocery stores. So we have, um, you know, New Seasons Market and Market of Choice and Zoo Pants, and those are all local chains that are just in Oregon, and they really grabbed on to all of us local makers and said, you know, we're going to put, we're going to make special end caps for you because our community wants to support you. We're going to put your product on sale and you don't have to, you know, take that cut. So they really supported us because we all of a sudden didn't have any events to sell at, you know? So I think that our community here is really strong and it showed that within our food community from all avenues, from the farmer's market, from the stores, I think that it's really good. And we're just, I mean, we're still all just hanging on, you know, just like waiting for things to get yeah. back. But but I think we're all still here, which is good. As long as you're here, that's the most important. Yeah. And it's really interesting. I've heard the same thing from a lot of folks who I've had a chance to touch base with, which is people, consumers, and um, and then companies like grocery store chains are realizing the importance of supporting the local and regional food system and the way that that support reverberates throughout their community. Um, you know, that it's like, it's kind of like people had almost like something of, a, of an aha moment, like a light bulb finally went off, that it's not just this trendy feel good, oh yeah, we're supporting local. It really helps to support the economic vitality of your community and your region. Yeah. And that's why it's important. I mean, the fact that it's delicious and environmentally sustainable and all these other things, you know, that's great too. But, but really when you can economically support your neighbor, I mean, that's when you have a resilient community. Yeah, and I think it's so important, and I think people are, I mean, I think people have already always understood it, but I think they really understand it now, and at least here, we see a lot of that. People want to buy from us directly, which you, and you know, so buy from our website, which usually people wouldn't search that out. They would be like, I'll just go get it from, you know, the store or something, but now they're not like, no, I want this money to go for you, so you survive, but <laughs> you get through this, you know, and it was so important. And then now I think the big focus here is on restaurants, because I think now it's their turn um, to get all of our love and help and support. And we had really awesome restaurant owners that were doing a lot of, you know, um, you know, telling Congress what they need, telling us what we needed to do to be able to help them and support them. And so we, the food, you know, everybody else has now been like trying to support the restaurants to keep them going. That's so important, too. It's a huge interconnected ecosystem web of people. And, yeah. and I think that that's, that's something that also the, just the general consumer is kind of waking up to, that it's not just your favorite restaurant. It's not just your favorite stand at the farmer's market. Everything is interconnected and it all matters. Uh, but you mentioned that people can buy directly from you. So tell us your website and what people can access there. Yeah, so um, you can order all of our sauces on our website, which is marshallshutsauce.com. So it's H-A-U-T-E. Uh, you can get all of our sauces there. The wine you buy from Union. And so you can go to their website. It's unionwine.com. And it's under the King's Ridge label. And so you can buy it there. And it's just the cranberry, um, red jalapeno, um, pino, hot pino. And then um, they also have a combination on their website where you can get our the wine and a gift pack of our hot sauces together and they'll ship them both out to you. That's awesome. Oh, yeah. Sarah, it is <laughs> so good to catch up with you. Before we sign off, kind of um, let us know what's coming up for spring. Are you working on any new stuff? Well, yeah, so our, you know, our flavors kind of come in and out of season. So we have a couple of really fun ones we're adding this weekend. And one is that we do this, um, sauce. This is the charred chive dulce. And so I dehydrate, this is another one that just tells the story of Oregon very well. So I dehydrate seaweed, dulce seaweed from the Oregon coast. And it's this really beautiful purple seaweed. And I dehydrate it and put it into the sauce with um, charred garlic chives and that I get from one of our farmers at the market. And so it's really awesome for doing like stir fries and things because the seaweed adds this nice saltiness. It's got organic miso in there. It's just a really beautiful sauce for cooking with. I was trying to make something that 
since everyone's cooking at home and they want a quick and easy meal, they can just throw that in with some veggies and do a quick stir fry, or um, it's great on meats on the grill. And then another one we have is this hatch sesame balsamic. And that one is a really fun one because I put um, sesame seeds into it with uh, all these toasted spices like coriander and cumin, and then I strain it out. So what's left is kind of this nice silky texture. So it's a really wonderful, fun sauce that we have going on. And it has some um, white balsamic vinegar in there. It's really beautiful. So you can find those on our website this weekend. That sounds amazing. And I also want to plug your, your cooking videos. You get on the Instagrams and you're like, you, you cook for people how many times a week? At least once a week. I do it every week, yeah. I do it on Thursdays at two o'clock. And that was really a way for me to stay connected with our shoppers, with my friends, with my family that I was not seeing. So when I'm doing it live, a lot of my buddies will come on and just kind of chat with me about things. But what I'm really doing is trying to get people to get some things from the farmer's market, to cook something quick and easy at home. You know, I'm really just making lunch or dinner for my family really fast. And I'm doing it in, you know, 20 minutes about. So I'm getting local ingredients, making something really easy. I used to post a lot of recipes on our website. They're really complicated because I wanted to be teaching people new skills. And I really had to make things a lot simpler for people that just, they just need to get it done. They need to get some food on the table. They need to get some healthy food on the table and they need to do it quickly. So I do those videos every Thursday too. And you can watch those on our Instagram and it's on mine, which is Spicy Marshall. Perfect. Well, we will be watching. Sarah, thank you. It's great to catch up with you and to raise a glass together. Yeah, Cheers. it's so good. It's so good to see you. Cheers. I miss you. I hope we can see each other in real life sometime soon. Absolutely. <laughs> I look forward to it, Sarah. I will see you soon. Thank you. Bye, Bye. Cass. Bye. I hope you.